Hello, everyone. It's Sam Ekman of Gold Derby. I am here with Christopher Wielden, director and choreographer of MJ, and a two-time nominee for his for his efforts here. Congratulations, Christopher. Uh, it's really wonderful work on on this. Um, Thank you. I I do have to imagine. I think one of the biggest pleasant surprises to me when I saw this show was that you didn't just go in and directly copy or recreate Michael Jackson's dances uh, because he has very iconic, uh, you know, music videos and, and concerts. Uh, so these images are in people's heads. So I imagine it takes some guts to sort of go in and say, we're going to change some things. So <laughs> was it difficult to sort of go in your own direction with songs and, and dances that were so iconic? No, I mean, I don't, I don't think so, because I think the goal always really from the beginning was to find a way to sort of capture the essence of Michael, but also make a new piece of art that, um, you know, that while sort of, you know, embracing that essence and kind of weaving it through the tapestry of the show, um, that it was, you know, seeing Michael's musical language, his, his his dance vocabulary through through the lens of Lynn Nottage, through my lens, through David Holsenberg and Jason Michael Webb's lens, so that we were bringing ourselves to the project and not making a show that was just simply um, an impersonation or kind of a recreation um, of, of Michael. Because to be honest with you, that's kind of a little bit of a futile task, re recreating, you know, one of the greatest showman that ever lived if not the greatest showman perhaps that ever lived um uh it's just something that none of us were really interested in doing yeah it, it's kind of recontextualizing in many ways a lot of his music uh, to tell this story um when as someone who has danced in them obviously as a choreographer when you watch someone like michael move if you're studying his dancing does that give you what kind of insight does that give you when you're telling this story? Well, listen, I mean, Michael was so extraordinary as a dancer. His um, his movement was so explosive, so um, articulate. Um, I mean, maybe the most articulate dancer I think I've ever seen. His ability to move quickly and hit and hit a position um, and then hit the next position. And it was interesting because um, we worked, I worked a little bit with um, Rich and Tone Talawega who had both worked with Michael, had danced for Michael, both choreograph choreographers themselves, but <clears throat> had worked with Michael as dancers and which was brilliant because they were able to kind of bring um, a, a real sense of authenticity and understanding of first-hand understanding of the intention of the movement from Michael. But one of the things that I noticed, and they expressed actually, um, that I noticed really when I was studying videos of Michael was that you could pretty much pause him in any moment. And he was never between the movement. He was always kind of there. And I think that just goes to show you how much precision and speed he had in his body. Um, uh, so that was something that was, was was interesting to discover and then, of course, kind of try to find ways to instill that into the, the performers playing Michael. Mm. Well, those performers, I'm so curious as to how you found Miles Frost, because it's a great, I think, discovery for all of Broadway uh, being introduced to him. And that movement is perfectly layered onto his body. What was the process of finding him? Uh, I mean, it was really, it, uh, Miles kind of came out of the blue, um, really for us sort of quite last minute because we had another performer playing Michael who, you know, unfortunately left us kind of last spring, pretty much a little bit before this time last year. And we didn't have that long really to find another one. So um, we were all a little bit sort of at, uh, at the end of frayed nerves and, um, <laughs> And Miles came to us really purely from as a recommendation from someone who had done an acting workshop with him during the pandemic um, and had and had said, you know, there's this guy and, you know, he I think he can sing quite well. And of course, then I YouTube him and I'm like, well, not only does he sing well, but he's also singing Michael. Um, <clears throat> and and so we had him come in to us and, and audition in person um, under sort of strange post pandemic but still sort of pandemic um, um, rules um, and he just 
commanded the room in a way that I thought was extraordinary for someone with so little experience. Um, he was very humble, of course, but his vocus was so undeniably sort of laser and, um, and just the talent, the amount of raw talent that he displayed in that first audition, I think made us all go, okay, well, he's a big, big risk because he's done nothing. I mean, aside from a few high school musical productions and had been recording some, and he'd done a little bit on camera, but had done no professional theater. So there was a big risk factor, I suppose, that sort of kicked in, um, but the talent was undeniable. And I think we all agreed that if he would put in the work that he was gonna like blow the roof off the theater and thank goodness he did and thank goodness he does. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a, I believe you were developing this with Lynn Nottage uh, who wrote the book for a few years. So what were the early conversations like with her and how were you looking at kind of making this different than than other bio musicals for other stars? Yeah, I mean, I think um, some people consider kind of the bio musical to be, you know, very, uh, perhaps now sort of a bit of a stagnant form because it's been so successful so many times. Um, I suppose Jersey Boys being the first kind of iconic bio musical and, um, and then sort of many others who, that have been very successful following. And, and, I, and Lynn was never really that interested in making kind of an origin to sort of grave story. She wanted to find, pinpoint a moment in time, find a, um, yeah, find a moment that seemed like an interesting um, anchor, I suppose, for the telling of Michael's story, um, his, his sort of meteoric, you know, rise to stardom, his relationship with his family, kind of tell that story through up until where we're set, which is 1992. Um, some people have said, oh, well, that's convenient because that's kind of before all the, all, the, um, all the sort of major controversy kind of kicked off, but it's not really actually. I mean, maybe it's, it's a little bit before sort of it kicked off really in the press, but Michael was already um, living a very complex and, and, um, and lonely life. And he was also in that, you know, in that time, um, sort of set around the the Dangerous album and the Dangerous tour, um, really questioning himself as an artist and pushing really hard to innovate and achieving that, but actually wearing himself thin in the process. And I think, um, uh, and I think was sort of on the precipice of you know the change a change of taste in music. People were sort of starting mm -hmm. to lean towards the kind of the Nirvana, the indie rock. Um, you know, um, uh, early to mid '90s taste was just very different from the, the from the taste of the '80s, and Michael had really set himself, um, uh, you know, to up to be the the greatest star pop star that ever lived over the course of kind of the '70s and the '80s. Um, so it was just a just an interesting moment in his in his life in his career as an artist, and that's what we wanted to focus on the what it takes to be a great, great artist, if not the greatest. <laughs> One of my favorite moments of the entire show, I think, was you go in, you move into Smooth Criminal by sort of bringing out these three uh, dancers with that were inspiration to him with Fosse, Fred Astaire, the Nicholas Brothers. And it's a great moment. How did that come about? How did you put that one together? Well, the, so the, so there are two kind of uh, what we what we were as we were developing the show we call them kind of anatomy moments and the anatomy of a song and then the anatomy of a dance and in that one you kind of get you get to we get to sort of live with Michael as he sort of discovers how wanna be starting something gets put together you know starting with him recording tracks of his own voice and taking that to Quincy Jones in the studio and sort of developing the song and it. What it delivers in the show is this you know really kind of exhilarating ride through the, the beginnings the origins of the thriller album through to winning all the grammys and it's really fun fun sequence um and then in act two we thought well what better way to start act two than sort of doing the anatomy of michael as a dancer and um and sort of showing his his great dance inspirations and um and so that was just that was a fun sequence for me as a choreographer 
a really fun sequence to put together, kind of figure out how to break it all down and maybe show through those inspirations how some of his iconic poses were, were built and then his his language, his, you know, the the expression in his hands coming from Bob Fosse and some of those, some of these kind of hats sort of, you, were almost, you could almost picture, picture the top hat, the cane of Fred Astaire and, um, yeah, so that's that's sort of how that came about. You almost have to be a, a student of all of those people as well as Michael while you're making the the show. <laughs> yeah, luckily, so. I, luckily I am. So <laughs> I went through all of that when I was working on an American in Paris, studying Gene Kelly, who of course was also a great inspiration to Michael, and um, and I think that's where he got the white socks and the you know the the short pants, black pants, and the white socks and the and the kind of loafers from that that's an iconic Gene Kelly look. Yeah. And that moment you mentioned before in Thriller, it's kind of like the Thriller suite that takes you through. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, it's such high intensity and it keeps ratcheting up the intensity. And by the end, you're like, how have these people not collapsed yet? Uh, because they're doing such incredible work. When you're crafting a piece, how long does it take to get to that point where you have paced everything out to say that one, that this is what it takes to make this into a showstopper? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the things that, that you get on Broadway on a big musical is you do get some development time. So we spent quite a lot of time working up through kind of workshop versions of the show. And we ended up doing, I think, five workshops um, through to opening. And so, you know, and with each one, you're discovering more and more about your show and, how, you know, what, what each number kind of means. And the structure of each number in the show, we discovered we discovered them quite early. In fact, the placement of the songs um, didn't really change very much from our first workshop, but the storytelling within them became more and more developed. And it wasn't until this more recent, well, actually it wasn't really until we went into rehearsal, the rehearsal process for Broadway, that we decided to incorporate the video shoot for Thriller, for the Thriller vi video into that wannabe start with something sequence, you know, and, um, and and so it, it sort of and then you put it in front of an audience and you you know you either know that you are are taking them on enough of a journey that by the end of it they're in a state of exhilaration which that sequence luckily does um or you go back to the drawing board and you say okay we need to add something or maybe you need to tweak here maybe there's too much of this not enough of that but actually i have to say for the most part we kind of got it right early on and but adding the thriller sequence giving teasing up thriller michael's thriller in fact in act one but then delivering our thriller in act two um it was kind of a component that was missing from the previous workshop and we couldn't quite figure out what it was um and so that was that was a fun discovery yeah i find it surprising that you know the placement didn't change because i would think it would be so difficult to take a catalog this vast with so many hits in it uh but it was it easy to find you know where each one would go and where it would fit in your storytelling yeah i mean we worked really closely with with david holsenberg who um i mean len and david worked kind of exhaustively actually i have to say on finding the right sort of the right material for the right moments and and we we built some of the story structure around certain songs like we knew we knew we wanted thriller to end up being sort of the culmination of the story between michael and his father we just weren't sure, sure where it should go and at one point we had it at the end of act one and another point we had it so we were we were shifting things around but i'd say by our sort of pre-covid workshop we had the structure pretty much down we added a few things um uh, and shifted a couple of things around for for um, for Broadway rehearsals, but but for the most part, the structure was was already formed. Yeah. Well, I also wanted to ask because this is your your second go around with the the Tony Awards. Last time you were up for American in Paris and won for Best Choreography. What does it feel like for the rest of us who haven't had the opportunity <laughs> to stand on that stage? What does it feel like when you're in that room and your name is called and you're you're up there holding the Tony as the winner? You know, in that moment, it's really, of course, really truly exhilarating, and you know, you're you're extremely grateful for that recognition. Um, 
you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of swirl kind of, kind of around the Tonys always. Um, I grew up in the UK, I'm British and I come from the ballet world. And so awards don't really happen around ballet. They do a little bit more now, but they certainly when I was growing up, they don't. So even the Olivier's have become, they've sort of swung a little bit closer to the Tonys, but they're less, it's less of a thing here. I don't think it's quite so much of a, of a, of a, um, of a sort of selling tool for a show. I think, you know, it's great to be able to put the Olivier award winning musical, but I don't think it's quite the same. It's not quite so tied up into the business of a show as it is in the States. So, and I remember when we were doing American in Paris, I kind of set, you know, I asked politely, but quite firmly, my producers not to talk about the Tonys until if we were lucky enough to be nominated, fine. And we talk about the Tonys then, but, but the, uh, it's about the art. We have to make the best show we can. We can't feel pressured to have to fit into a category or, um, and I'm sort of, I'm quite grateful to still feel that way because as honored as I am, and I'm extremely honored and I'm not gonna lie, it's a good feeling to get up there and you know accept a Tony Award at Radio City Musical. We're making this work for our public and for um, and for the artists. You know that's kind of where where the heart of it, the core of it lies. Um, that said, uh, standing up on that stage and looking out at it, this iconic, vast, iconic hall, Radio City Musical, um, having you know my first trip to New York when I was nineteen, I did the Radio City Musical tour, and. You know, I knew about Radio City Music Hall mostly from the movie of Annie, believe it or not, which was a movie <laughs> that I loved growing up. Um, I was kind of obsessed with as a kid. So it's sort of, you know, it, it's definitely a pinch me moment. Like I can't quite believe that I'm on this stage as, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, but then that's been my whole New York experience, quite honestly. So. Well, who knows, maybe there'll be another pinch me moment in, in your future. Um, so who thank knows? you. Thank you, Christopher, for joining me. A fantastic job on MJ. Everyone who's watching, subscribe to Gold Derby and stay with us throughout this Broadway season. Thanks again, Chris. Thanks, Sam.